If you've been enjoying our free The Reason for Everything podcast, please be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on all platforms or wherever you get your podcasts. I, uh, yeah, it's always fun to connect to other like-minded folks. I like, I used to start up my show with asking my guests to pick a walk-up song when I was first starting my podcast. Cause I didn't really want, I didn't really know what I was doing coming on. I knew yeah, that's a great that, question. It's fun. And so I, I, I like to ask that, but I've, you know, transitioned into quotes. I've transitioned to other ideas, uh, kind of just depends, but you being, a an athlete, a, a, a sports oriented individual or an athletics oriented individual. If you have a walk-up song top of mind, I'd love to tee that up for you. And then uh, I've got another one for you. Walk-up song. How about One Republic, Good Life? Ooh, that's really good. That's really, really good. Does that, uh, that song have any particular meaning for you or just the, the messaging the, in, the, in the actual song? Or was there a time or place that you can get you know, transported to when you hear it? Yeah, you know, I look at music, I'm, music really interestingly, like, I'm not that big of a music guy, but I like certain songs, I guess, that, that what does music do? It creates feeling, right? And inspires feeling. Yeah. So when you say walk up song, what, what do I, what do I want? What am I walking towards here? I'm walking towards a good life. That's what I want. So I like that's it. Context. Well, I'd love to, uh, to give you a chance to introduce yourself to my audience. But before we do that, I saw a quote that you posted on, on your Instagram months ago. And that just spoke with me as soon as we got connected. And I wanted to give you a chance to share your thoughts a little bit further. And I don't want to butcher it. So I wrote it down. You wrote, take things as granted versus for granted. I absolutely love that. And I'd love to maybe give you a chance to walk us through that idea a little bit further. And we can go from there. Yeah. Yeah, that was a little while ago. Man, you did your research. That's awesome. I, I look at it like it's really like, I think, context bias up to the brain mm. that we get stuck in this world now where uh, we really are kind of creating challenges for ourselves and creating discomforts. And I think a, I'm big on what's the right frame. Like what's the right frame to look at things. That's, that's a question that I consistently ask myself. I was talking with my dad earlier and he's dealing with my, my mom who has dementia and he's, they're getting ready to go to a trip to West Africa. And, He's like, you know, I feel like I, I have to get, I have to prepare for two of us to be able to get there. I don't know if we're going to, I'm going to be able to do this. And then I said, well, Hey, you know, I just read a research paper that looked at the longest living people in the world. And one of the things that they all share, these are people who are like over the age of 115 is that they all were ruthless about doing everything themselves until the day they passed away. So I was like, why don't you just look at it like that frame? Like you're strengthening your so, and he's, he said like, you know, what doesn't kill me, make me stronger. Right. Like you kind of laughed, like, but I think it, this falls under that context where it's, it's the frame. We can either look at things like our health, our family, uh, getting the opportunity to connect with people like you as that's just kind of what we have in our everyday life. Or we can look at it as a blessing that we are really, we get an opportunity to encounter. Yeah. I was just having a conversation with my dad right before we started filming, ironically. And I don't know if you had a chance to see the eclipse at all today. Did you guys get any glimpse of that down in Miami? No, it was, it was cloudy down here. Well, okay. I, I wasn't, I wasn't like all, all over it, but in my understanding, there wasn't too much going on in Miami, but I saw some stuff online. It looked amazing. Yeah. I'm in, in the DC area, like I said, and there was a pretty good view of it. I was able to take a, a walk and I was down by the white house and it was crazy to see so many people just heads down, focused on their day, didn't even look up and see what everyone else was doing, wearing these funky glasses, looking up at the sun. And there were so many people that were just in their rut, in their routine, taking life for granted without even actually watching the movie unfold in front of them. Uh, yeah, and God's so today, up there. Oh, yeah. Big time. Big time. And so um, that, that was my kind of uh, you know perception realignment today when I was just trying to enjoy the moment, taking a step away from my blue light and screens. And being out in, in the in the world and seeing everyone kind of communally going and enjoying this once in a you know 
blue, well, I guess not blue moon would be a bad example here. Once in a, you know, every 20 decade or 20 years sort of thing. So all that's to say, love that quote. And it really spoke with me when I saw you post it. So with that, I'd love to give you a chance to maybe introduce yourself to my audience a little further. Um, and we can go from there. Sure. Well, I'm the CEO and head coach of a company called Super Athlete. And I lead a team of world-class coaches that help people optimize their performance and longevity. And it's called Super Athlete because all of our coaches have a background in pro sports. And the way we view things is if you look at the best athletes and performers in the world, they have a team of coaches working for them to help them look, feel, and perform at their best. And because of sports science, because of tech, because of internet, and all the stuff we have access to, you know, that being able to get that opportunity is now available to a much broader population. How did you start this business in the first place? Were you always an athletic individual? Did you grow up in the, in the Miami area or what was your relationship like with athletics growing up? Sure. So I grew up in the, on the West coast, uh, Portland, Oregon, Bay area, Oakland, California, and my background has really been connecting with mentors who are very high level coaches. Um, so over the past 15 years, kind of half my life has been entrepreneur CEO in the performance space. And the other half has been coach uh, working with athletes and working with a number of these world-class coaches. And it started really with some of my mentors who these are some of the most accomplished coaches of their generation. They've helped, uh, dozens of Olympic athletes medal. They've helped hundreds of, uh, pro pro athletes. They've helped, you know, hundreds of people in the, in the special forces community, but they were so entrenched in their job in their community that they hadn't really gotten their name out into the world or started to, um, kind of leave their, their particular lane. So it really started with saying, Hey, I've seen all the amazing value you provided me and all these athletes that you've provided over the years. Why don't we bring this into the general population? Now, growing up in the Bay area, were you a Steve young guy or who was that? Who was the super athlete for you growing up? Super athlete. That would probably be Bo Jackson. Okay. Bo Jackson good, good was answer. super yeah. athlete. Yeah. Now growing up in, in the, on the West coast, you know, typical kind of similar coastal elites, East coast, West coast, probably similar upbringings, but what was your journey like as a kid? Were you always into sports and always athletic? Did you know that your calling was going to be in the realm of athletics and performance, or did you think you were going to go and be a CPA? What was it like for you growing up? When did you kind of realize that athletic performance, super athlete world was going to be your calling? You know, very entrepreneurial. So my great granddad was an entrepreneur. Uh, my grandfather was an entrepreneur. My dad was an entrepreneur and I caught that gene. I think there is some genetics involved with that. So I was very entrepreneurial and because of that school never really resonated with me. And because of that, I struggled a lot in school. So my personal athletic career was not what, uh, it could have been. Uh, hindsight 2020, I just had all this energy and had this entrepreneurial spirit. And I just was not able to channel it in a direct, in a direct way. So again, like half my life's like athlete, half my life is like entrepreneur and the entrepreneur part uh, is what dominated my, my childhood. So I was, I did all kinds of different businesses. Um, yeah, legal and illegal. Uh, which got me into some trouble after high school, which led to me taking a unorthodox approach to getting into this space. Because instead of going into like working for like a university, like university like of Cal or, or Stanford or something like that, and working my way up to the ranks there, I had to take an unorthodox approach and, and find coaches who were working on their own uh, in the athletic performance space. In the, the spirit of the reason for everything, right? Like there's so many different avenues that your life could have gone down as a kid and young adult. Do you look back on that, the, you know, trouble you got in that got you to where you are today? Do you look back at that with gratitude? 
are there things you would have changed or done differently to get yourself to where you are today? Or what do you think about when you're, you know, reflecting on your journey as a young adult to get you to where you are today? And, you know, the unorthodox route you mentioned. That's a great question because, and I think that's that we can look at mistakes we've made in our past and challenges that we've made in our past. One side, the right frame is, yes, I was able to get on a path that put me where I am now, where I'm very grateful to be in this position and to have built those relationships. So I did turn adversity into my ally in that context, but also someone who's been obsessed with growth and accumulating wisdom over the past 20 years. Another part of me is like, damn, I wish I... <laughs> I would have made some better choices when I was younger too. So there's kind of a dichotomy there where one side of me is like, yeah, um, this adversity is what is what set me on the path to get me where I am now. But on the other side of it, it was, yeah, you know, I could have probably made a couple wiser decisions back in the day. Let's maybe double click on that a little bit further. So you, you wrap up high school what was your college experience like? Did you have a college experience? What was, you know, your young adulthood like as you were getting into the workforce before this idea of, you know, super athletes started coming to brew in your brain? Sure. So after high school, I didn't go directly to college. Uh, I went into sales. So that was a, a plus for me. Um, I don't, I, when I was listening to your episodes earlier, it seems like you have a, a business centric audience, a young, younger business centric audience in their twenties. Is that accurate? Yeah. Spot on. Okay. So I would say for sure, a, a piece of advice I would give is sales is still king. So I was really fortunate to uh, get into sales after high school. Um, that's where I got into a little bit of the legal trouble and I had to kind of navigate through all that. And then around the age 20, 21, you know, I don't know why, if it was a block in my brain or what, but I just, that was like the first time I really realized that we can improve ourselves, hmm. like through self-development. Um, so that's when I, I went to community college. I uh, graduated that very quickly. I got two master's degrees and I, I basically did them at the same time and got done with that. And hindsight 2020, again, I was just, I don't know if that was the most effective decision <laughs> looking back, but I was just so hungry to learn, so thirsty. Like I realized, oh, I can grow my brain. I, I have two sons and I was talking, my fiance's uh, brother just had a, uh, his first son a few days ago. And I sent him this book by Carol Dweck. Are you familiar with it? It's called The Growth Mindset. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So there's the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. So I was I was like the definition of someone who had a, a fixed mindset growing up. Mm -hmm. And the big shift for me was realizing that was making that shift to the growth mindset that I can develop myself. And just to put to close the loop on that story. So I sent him this book. And I have two teenage boys, ages 14 and 12. And I said, man, the number one thing you can teach your kids, like th through, through experience, what I have found is teach them to praise them for effort rather than like innate talent. You know, don't tell them how smart they are. To praise them for how much effort they put into to demonstrate that intellect. Uh, but I was fortunate enough to do that with my boys and just – they're intrinsically motivated. Uh, they believe with stuff they're passionate about that if they, if they want it through hard work and drive, they can go get it. Totally resonate with that and, and agree with the principle of growth mindset versus fixed. And I was definitely in the same camp of a very fixed mindset up until about a couple of years ago. I read The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. That was my, my kind of growth mindset. That was my clone of the growth mindset that got me to kind of down this journey of, of where I am today. But are you familiar I, with Carlos Castaneda? Uh, I don't think I am. Dude, what, what, you got to check him out. He's, he's a, he's Toltec wisdom guy like Don Miguel Ruiz. Okay. You said his name was Carlos. What was it? Castaneda. I'll I'll check it out. I probably butchered the spelling. I'll send you the, he's got one particular book. That's just uh, absolutely incredible, but I'll send yeah. you the link. 
I'll tap. I got to start our free book club. There's just too many good titles that get thrown around. And, uh, but nonetheless, I'd love to hear your perspective because one of the things that I think about a lot is, you know, the whole concept of participation trophies. And I agree with your point about rewarding effort versus intellect or not necessarily intellect, but like effort versus, uh, the actual, you know, outcomes, maybe how do you balance that with the idea of, you know, not wanting to give out participation trophies to everyone and kind of that juxtaposition there? Well, I'm definitely not a believer in particip participation trophies. I think that's a, it's a disservice to kids because they know, I mean, they, they know, they know whether or not it's really deserved. Yeah. Um, so to answer your question, context in terms of fixed and growth mindset, I would, okay, let's say my kid doesn't do very well. He doesn't win. I wouldn't give him a, I wouldn't want him to receive a trophy for that. Yeah. But I would want, you know, I would want to celebrate what he did do well and then say, okay, we didn't get the result that we really wanted. So what can we do? What are some things that we can do that can potentially improve this result for next time? Yep. That, but spot on. That, that, that's what I was looking to, to get a better understanding of, because it, it is this weird balance of trying to not discourage or not, you know, push down any or not build up any sort of resentment, but also saying, Hey, like you did a great job with this. Let's work on this. And, and I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A frame that I like to use that we use, we use this, I use this all the time on my, with myself and then our, our clients as well, not just kids, but after you do something, ask yourself uh, good, better, best. So <laughs> what'd you do? Well, what can you do better? And then what is, what are you at your best? What does that look like? So that works, these questions, that works for kids after a sporting event or it works, you know, after a podcast uh, to review, but it's just a great feedback loop. If you look at the best athletes in the world, the best performers, they all are consistently running a feedback loop on how to improve. It's not just, it's not just getting coaching, but it's feedback and calibrating and good, better, best is a great frame and great feedback loop you can apply. I really like that a lot. And I also think one of the frameworks that I'm thinking through and, and trying to build my personal thesis around is uh, balancing or not letting, uh, what is it, perfect be the enemy of good or great and actually encouraging other folks. I've had a lot of people reach out to me in, in my podcasting journey of, hey, how'd you even get this started in the first place? Oh, I have this business idea that I want to do. What should I do with this? And my advice is always just go out and actually start doing the thing, building the thing, creating the thing, because at that point you create that feedback loop. But I think that there's so many people that also believe if you just do the thing, you're going to get the feedback, which you will. But I like your idea of good, better, best, because that's actually giving a methodology to practice and to give yourself or the people around you and in your group that you're building with to have some sort of postmortem and, and review as opposed to just thinking passively about what you could do better at or what you were, you know, what you'd look at at your best. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's a, a good frame to look at that because yes, you just want to get started and start getting the reps in. But at the same time, I mean, you want high standards, right? Yeah. And, you know, when I see something that doesn't meet my standards, it's still something that I deal with as a, a CEO and as a leader of, okay, you know, we're working toward what we want. But the other half of me is like, ah, but you know, like, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I like the frame that you used in that it's, it's not just go out there and do it. Yes, you want to go out there and do it and get the reps, but at the same time, understand that, you know, attention to detail matters and having standards matters. It really does. Now, you mentioned, you know, you were 20, 21 when you read Growth Mindset and kind of started down this journey of, hey, I can go and better myself. What did the progression of that journey look like through your 20s as you were in your sales role, learning more, getting out into the world for your next ventures? What was the application of integrating the growth mindset into your life? What did that look like for you in your 20s? You know, the biggest thing, it wasn't the growth mindset in my early 20s. It was, it was this idea. Have you ever heard of Abraham Maslow? I don't believe so. Like Maslow's hierarchy, Abraham Maslow? That's, that's Abraham Maslow. And he's known for Maslow's hierarchy. But he also had this idea, he was a Brooklyn psychologist, of 
of every moment we have an opportunity to step forward into growth or step back into safety. And for some hmm. reason, that's something that really resonated with me and on my journey, because I kind of played the victim growing up where I thought that I, my situation was because of my external environment, because of the way I grew up, not because of the choices I made. And what Maslow said was, was it's work, our spirit, our subconscious is keeping score. So every moment we're either stepping forward into growth or back into safety. And at the end of the day, how we feel about ourselves is going to be based on how many times we step forward into the better version of ourselves compared to how many times we step back into the lesser version of ourselves. So I say that with context there. That's what led me into exercise and fitness because I realized there that you can control that one of the things you can do to set yourself up for your, for success is by really controlling your physiology. And uh, that led me in my twenties to expand from sales, to really start seeking out these coaches and seeking out these mentors that led me into this space. So to put it kind of simply found Maslow realized, Oh, okay. The reason you're the choice, the reason you're, you are where you are, the reason you feel like shit and you're so angry, it's not because of anything external. It's because of what, how you, it's because of your behavior. One, two, that led me into, okay, how can I improve my behavior? Well, one of the things I could do is I could really dial in my body. I started doing that. And then three, that led me into starting to find a number of different coaches in the area who took me under their wing and I worked with them and, and they mentored me. What did that look like for you from a, like mechanically speaking, what did that look like for you? Were you, cause this was how many years ago, 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago? About 15 years ago. Yeah. So pre Instagram DMs, like how we got connected. What did that mm. look like for you? Mechanically speaking, were you emailing folks? Were you cold calling? Were you sending, uh, you know, paper mail? How did you get in touch with these coaches? How did you build your network as you were getting involved in the fitness space? That's a great question. So I started just looking around locally. So maybe it was, it was probably Facebook. This is pre Instagram. When did Instagram start taking off? Like 2011? 15, yeah, 11, 15, something 11, like that. 11, 11, 15 in that range. Yeah. So probably Facebook. And, but and the beautiful thing is one led to another. Yeah. Um, so I, I found, I found one who led me to another, who led me to another. And yeah, but. I'm a big believer in, in, in outreach. People want to help, especially, um, I'm a huge, I'm a hu huge fan of, uh, mentors over the age of 60. <laughs> Not, I also believe just because you're over the age of 60 doesn't mean that you're a wise person, but if you are someone who is, who has developed themselves, then of course, if you've been doing that for 20, 30, 40 years, then you're just going to have a certain amount of wisdom that can't be duplicated by someone your age or my age, you know? Yeah. Just again, back to the point of have they've done, had more reps than we have, you know, in each day to day. Mm. When you were reaching out to these folks on Facebook, early days of social media, what was the end goal for you? Were you just trying to build your concentric network? Were you trying to build this business in mind? Like what was, what were, what was the there there as you were reaching out to these folks in the early days of social media, early days of what is now super athlete? It definitely wasn't, where we to get where we are now uh, what it was was i just wanted to learn you know hmm. like I, I was hungry to learn and i wanted to learn from the best you know so i was fortunate enough to to connect with a uh, former strength and conditioning coach for the san francisco 49ers who became a mentor of mine i was fortunate enough to connect with a gentleman by the name of remy Korkemi, who's one of the greatest track coaches in history i was fortunate enough to connect with dr michael ripley who's working with us at super athlete who's helped 38 olympic athletes medal i was fortunate enough to connect with mike gerson who was one of the first mental training coaches hired by the united states army in 2006 he helped develop their program they have like 650 of them now because <laughs> they understand the importance of how important that is for for their soldiers so I was just really blessed to get this network and I've always been able to kind of be kind of court gesture, um, 
charismatic to make myself interesting with people. That's one of the strengths, strengths I've always had. So I was able to uh, get in good graces with these guys. Just, just said, how can I help? You know, I want, I want to work. Yeah. Now you're reaching out to these folks. You're having what I assume is some sort of informational interview. You're getting smarter on the space. How long did that go on for before you started to come up with this business model, this idea? What was that kind of initial outreach to maybe business model? What did that look like for you? So what it was probably about four years of working. And then I initially got into kind of the evolution of what super athlete is now by doing online fitness coaching which was based on the work that we were doing on the track with one of my mentors. Hmm. So about four years of just working with these different coaches, I recognized early there was not as many <laughs> fitness online fitness coaches as there is now. Um, so it was a much, it was a much less competitive space. So I was able to, again, my whole life, it's been half kind of athletics, half kind of entrepreneurship. I recognize that opportunity. And I started just filming what we were doing on the track. And that led to, to online coaching, which led to products, which then in turn led to kind of where we are now in this iteration of the company, where it's a bunch of coaches that have come together to help our customers optimize their performance and longevity. So V0, the initial version of this business was online coaching the added products, I'm assuming some of the supplements like you have up on your, uh, on your bookshelf there. Mm. Now in, in current state, what does the business look like? What is kind of the suite of services that you guys are offering to your client base? You know, we do, we go all in. So we do, we do blood testing. We provide our clients with the biometric wearable. We do gene testing and the beautiful thing that makes our business unique is we provide daily live coaching to our mm -hmm. clients and it's not just with our team it's which we have guest coaches that come in every week so it's really been a blessing to me because it goes back to kind of like what how i got here in the first place of me just wanting to talk with really interesting people like we had someone on here uh, last week uh, monica who is a she's a world record holder in bicycle racing from switzerland which is like, how in the world is she connecting with what we're doing? But she came on and she absolutely killed it with her, with our clients in the, and they got an opportunity to speak with the world record holder. And then she taught them about grit and perseverance and training and things like that. So we, I'm a big believer in, we assess, we don't guess. So we get blood work done. We look at your heart rate variability. We look at your nutritional deficiencies. We figure all of that out. Then we find out what your specific goals are. Once we get all that, we get a personalized plan for you in place. And then we uh, provide this daily coaching that you get access to. So you can interact with myself and dozens of other world-class coaches. So cool. And a very interesting model, especially given the timing of when you guys got started to now, or to your point earlier, you open up Instagram, every other thing you're swiping up is a, you know, influencer that has a fitness influencer that has their own unique training program, but the fact that you guys kind of have this longstanding business and client base pre influencer era is, is pretty neat and unique. Let me ask you this about, you know, as the rise of creators, content creators came to be over the last call it five, seven, 10 years or so, you guys are already into a mature business at this point. What were the conversations like for you all in your boardroom or whatever your metaphorical boardroom is? I'm not sure if you guys have those meetings, you know, in the weight room or what that looks like for you all, but what was what were conversations like when you were thinking about, you know, the existential threat to your business being some, you know, 18 year old with an iPhone and a, and a microphone that they can wear to the gym and walk through uh, and walk through their workout plans or, or whatever it is. I'm assuming it's, you know, the full suite of services that you guys offer that nobody else does. But how do you guys think about addressing, you know, the kind of constant changing trends of health and wellness? That's a great question because it's a very competitive space. And you're right. There is a, a, a 18 year old kid who can walk in with a mic and, uh, to a gym and, and start uh, selling programs and God bless him. I mean, I think that's an incredible 
it's just an incredible time that we live in. Um, yeah. Uh, no hate uh, coming from over here. So it's, w- what can we do to differentiate? So we could differ- differentiate by having medical doctors on staff. Okay. So mm-hmm. we, we can give you a, a good look in terms of a, a thorough assessment of what's going on. You, checking your blood's like checking the engine of a car, right? So to get a good idea of what's going on and what's potentially holding you back from, from going top speed. So that's one thing we did. That's, that was another, this is where the idea of the daily life coaching came from. It's like, okay, what are the, some of these other people not doing? They're all providing uh, online programs. They're all providing high quality video. How can we create more of a community? Um, that's where the daily life coaching came in. And then just the amount of different coaches and different, we're big in leadership here. That's kind of like an underlying context of, of what we're selling. We're, we're, we want to make better leaders. So um, we want to get you in peak physical condition to be able to, to set new records in the gym and whatever you're competing at, whether that's in MMA or, or, or basketball or whatever it is, but also, we want you to be in peak physical and mental condition so you could be a great leader for yourself, for your team, for your family. So leadership is another way that we differentiated your, ourselves. Uh, but that's a great question because it's something that we ask and we consistently ask because it is yeah. such a, uh, a competitive space. Do you know who Sam Sulek is? Sam Sulek? Yeah, oh, the... yeah. yeah, he's, yeah. Sam's great. Uh, uh, opinions, I don't know if, you know what his supplement stack looks like for lack of other terms, but the idea that he can just go on with a pretty low cost camera and low cost mm-hmm. mic, all things considered and get millions of views, every single video that he puts out where he drives to the gym, has his camera up and says, Hey, here's what I'm going to going to go do today. I had a test. He's in college. So I had a test goes, goes and does his workouts, goes back and posts his, you know, follow-ups in his video and then posts it every single day at such a low cost. It's just, it's pretty crazy. But the idea that you guys kind of offer this whole package is, is unique and interesting and, uh, the one question I have from that, I always hear Peter Atia talk about how important VO2 max is for a lifespan and, and calculating that. For someone who's listening to this or just, you know, in the health and wellness realm that's interested, what do you think the key, not to not for the super athlete secret sauce, but what's like the key metrics, things people should be looking out for in the gym from a baseline wellness perspective, whether it's a lift or whether it's a, a you know, reading on a blood chart, what do you think that are the key things that people should be looking out for uh, in the gym or, you know, on their blood work should be? Yeah. So in terms of the gym, relative strength, how strong you are relative to your body weight, grip strength, and VO2 max, uh, which Peter T is, uh, you know, a world thought leader on that. But we really love those three metrics because those are three metrics that are going to if you improve those now, they're going to improve your health and, and they're going to improve you today. But also they all directly correlate with longevity and anti-aging. So relative strength, how strong you are compared to your body weight, grip strength, and VO2 max. Those are the things we're, we're big on spec- specificity. Specificity. Specific. Can I talk here? Uh, <laughs> we're, we're big on... Uh, everyone's unique personalized goals. Like, so Sam Solik, like we wouldn't provide him a program that would say, Hey, we want you to improve your uh, VO two max. No, he'd get some kind of bodybuilding program. Right. 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 But those are three things overall that we like to assess and see where people are at. And we usually like to improve those areas. And then also for those that are just, if you're just looking to get, a optimized body and an optimized brain and get lean and get shredded, then I say uh, lift heavy weights and run really fast. Easy enough. I always say, you know, if you, it's pretty crazy what happens when you eat well, you sleep well and you exercise. It sounds yeah. crazy. I mean, but like, even for myself, I, I've, I wear my whoop band. I'm a huge fan of having the quantified metrics every single day to tell you know, what my, for me to be able to see what my baseline is because I don't have a daily coach. Right. But in that I think about, 
I, I've thought about it and I've been able to see, hey, when I don't sleep well, even if I exercise and I eat well and everything else, if I'm not sleeping well or not sleeping enough, there's a direct impact on my cognitive performance and a direct impact on my physical performance the next day. But it took me multiple years of wearing this and it's probably my own fixed mindset in the health and wellness space where I'm trying to shift to a growth mindset. But realizing that, hey, I really need to prioritize getting my sleep that's needed for me to be able to perform the next day. And I feel like it's so overlooked in you know the coastal elite societies that we both grew up in, you know? Yeah, we call, we call it the fundamentals and greatness yeah. is consistency on the fundamentals. So if you, mm. Phil Jackson, he had Michael Jordan passing, practicing bounce passes on his last day in the NBA, like Andy Reid, he has Patrick Mahomes practicing the simplest three-step drop the day before the Super Bowl still. And we have specific fundamentals like to our business and to our craft, but we all have a set of universal physiological fundamentals and their sleep. It's exercise. We, we call it training. We prefer that you're, you're training. You're not working out. Uh, nutrition, mindset, breath, and your ability to focus. And the more you get those dialed in, everything gets easier. No matter what it is you want to accomplish, everything gets easier. But you're right. In the world that we live in now, uh, sleep is not prioritized. Focus is not prioritized. Like we live in a world of digital distraction. You know, mindset is not prioritized. This idea of why, why aren't we hearing about growth mindset every day? You know, so these things are the building blocks, I believe, in greatness. And you're right. I mean, they're not prioritized. But if you get these basic things right, everything in life gets better. Mm -hmm. Pretty pretty crazy. Uh, sounds so simple, but it's pretty crazy when you actually put it all into, into the calculus of your day-to-day. -day. And I love that quote that greatness is consistency on fundamentals. Is that, what, is that what it was? Greatness is consistency on the fundamentals. Yeah, I got that That's from cool. Robin Sharma back in the day. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but Robin Sharma is another. I think I, you, you've, you've read some of his stuff. I heard you, one of your podcasts. Yeah, so yeah, you read them. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I love Robin Sharma. He's the shit. He's still, now, you yeah. got a, a pretty robust collection of books behind you. What's one that comes to mind for you that, you know, you, you bump into someone on the street. They say, Chase, I need a, a book recommendation. What do I dive into today? Just a blanket statement. What's one book that no matter who it is, you, you have to have them read it? Hmm. It depends. <laughs> well, give, give me what's the, what's the, what's the, what's the, the, the space. Tell me what, what's one book that you don't think I've read that I need to dig into that might be more niche than some of the other ones, whether it's Sharma or uh, Riaz that we've talked about, what's something I need to dig into. Okay. So business book, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in biographies. So again, mm -hmm. going with the business centric audience, Jerry Weintraub, when I stop talking, you know, I'm dead. Have you read that one? Haven't read it now. Okay. That one's fantastic. Yes. Um, that one's extraordinary. And then also Will Smith's biography, mm. incredible business book. I mean, if you look at most business books, it's like, you could distill this down into one page. It's usually like one idea and then they, they put stories and they put other stuff in it. But you look at like biography, like Will Smith, like he's got some amazing stories in there. Like it was very planned on what him and his team did for him to become the highest generating revenue actor in the world and just things like that. So that was another great one. And then the third biography I would say is, uh, Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger's biography, total recall is yep. fantastic as well. Spot on. I see the, uh, the Schwarzenegger on the, yeah, on that's fun. Yeah. That's his bodybuilding book, but he wrote, a, he wrote a biography 10 years ago. That was just really good called total recall. And uh, I highly on, recommend that. that. Now, that kind of segues into one of my final questions for you, which is you have an unbelievable portfolio of coaches and of clients. Who was, a, who was a client that you would love to have in your book of business that you would love to get in the super athlete engine that you think they're a perfect fit, whether it's you know someone famous or, or not, who's someone that you think would be served right by your all's program that might not be aware of it today? Wow. That's a great question. Who is someone that I would like to? So we, we, we like, we're big believers in developing high performance business athletes. So people who are getting into after, getting after it in business and we say, Hey, we're going to get you your 
body and your brain because our physiology drives it, our psychology, our, our body and brain are to get are connected. We're going to get those two things healthier than you've ever been. So I don't know if I can say anyone specific, but anyone killing it in business who is hungry to grow and improve, who recognizes the importance of this stuff that we're talking about. So we don't have to like force them and say, well, well I yeah. got to do this. Well, I got, you know, but who gets excited about challenging themselves physically. I would say that would be someone who would uh, be a great potential client for us. This might, might be crazier or a, a far field thought here. I'm curious whether it's with AI down the road and simulating something like this, or just using anecdotal examples, the two that come to mind right now are Bezos and Zuckerberg. Both of them have really prioritized health and wellness and fitness over the last couple of years and yeah. overlaying, overlaying their general physical, and this would require you know people releasing their medical records, yada, yada, but overlaying physical fitness with whether it's stock performance or business performance, it's, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of fluff you'd have to cut through to actually find the, the absolute value of what that looks like because of, you know, full market runs, whatever, but, you know, looking at what is, what has Facebook stock done since Mark Zuckerberg has been training jujitsu four days a week, or what has Amazon stock done since Bezos has prioritized himself in the gym over the last five years? Well, Facebook stock has gone crazy since he did what, I think they cut off or it, I'm, I'm naive to this, but I saw, it, I think they let go like 30% of their staff so that their, their profits um, have dramatically improved. So Facebook is killing it. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg is like the richest guy in the world for his age. If you put his age into yeah. consideration, but the way I would look at it is like, they have more energy. So like, yeah. how is having more energy not going to help you? in business like energy is we, like we're, we're always concerned with like time management or you know how am i going to get this done it's really am i going to have the energy am i going to have the brain power am i going to have the physical energy to show up and lead and the better physical condition you are the better your grip strength the better your vo2 max the better you're taking care of your fundamentals then the more energy you're going to have and energy really is the currency for high performance Kind of to that idea or, you know, crazy example that I gave, like you always hear about Warren Buffett. He eats his McDonald's hamburger and drinks his Coca-Cola every day. I'm sure there's some AI model that'll be out there one day where I could say, hey, if Warren Buffett had a sweet green salad every day for lunch and his chef cook him, you know, uh, a healthy dinner every night, well, how could, how much more cognitive ability could he have? And, you know, there's obviously uh, a, no independent variable in that, but it's a fun exercise that I'm running in my head now. I'm sure there's a bunch of examples of that, but. If someone out there has an idea of how to make that happen or run that data, I'd be interested to hear their perspective. Yeah, but, I mean, what works for him, he's killing it. 100%, 100%. Yeah. But Chase, maybe as we round out here, let's take someone who might be just at the start of their health and wellness journey, their training journey, as, as you guys call it. What would one piece of advice, where's the first starting point? Obviously, we, we'll, we'll refer them to you guys, people killing it in business that you know want to dig in a little further can go check out super athlete. We'll plug all the important stuff in the show notes, but for anyone that's early in their fitness journey that wants to get started, there's a lot of wood to chop hard to boil the ocean. Where's the first place that you'd recommend that they start as they kind of get on this journey? Well, I think it goes with what we were saying in terms of growth mindset. And I I'm really glad you brought that up because I get this question consistently of there's so many different voices in the health and wellness space. Who am I supposed to listen to? And going back to this idea of what is the right frame to look at that? The right frame, I believe, to look at that is we live in a very special time in human history where you can really take charge and figure out what works for you. So like now we're in a time where you don't even have to go to a company like us. In almost every state, it's legal to, to order a blood panel for yourself. You can get a biometric wearable like a whoop strap or an aura ring. What we still do with athletes today in 2024 with all this technology is when they walk into a walk into the gym, we say, how are you feeling? Like, how's your body feeling? And like, we can ask ourselves this question. So I guess the first thing I would say to that would be, you have the power now to take control more than ever before of your health and your body. And then the second piece would be what we talked about earlier, I think, was the fundamentals, like really work 
to get your nutrition dialed in, really work to get your sleep dialed in, your focus, your mindset, your breath. These simple things are going to provide a really deep foundation for you to go as far as you want to go. Even if you're at the start of your journey. I mean, you got to dig the foundation before you go anywhere, you know? It's so true. And to your point there, it's such an amazing time to be living in. Again, things that we're taking as granted versus for granted. You know, I'm, I'm grateful that we're able to have this video call hundreds of miles away and talk through, you know, our shared overlap of, of journey and experiences. Exciting time for us as individuals, us as business owners, for you as a CEO of Super Athlete, what are you most excited about for uh, the rest of this calendar year and beyond for this business that you're building? Rest of this calendar year is just, I just feel I'm really blessed to be, I love the clients that we work with. Uh, high performing people who are interested in growth. It's just, it's just such an inspiring community. I love the coaches that we work with that I get to learn from every single day. So I'm just inspired for, you know, more connection like this, just more connection with people. I think this, this is another thing when you asked earlier, like, how could we differentiate ourselves with our community, with our community, with our business? And then what some of these young people are doing really, really, really well is they're developing communities, which mm -hmm. is something that is needed now more than ever. You know, we're, we're social creatures. So I'm just really excited about the community that we're building and uh, the connections that are being made. And I'm from both ends, from our coach's side and from our client's side. Spot on. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, whenever I'm down in Miami, I'm excited to, to meet you in person. And uh, 100%. yeah, it's just grateful for your time. This is awesome. I really appreciate it. Yeah. No, God bless, Arjun. Uh, this was amazing. Mm -hmm.